Faith for Today with Colin Urquhart and Julia Fisher. We've been looking at this matter of soul and spirit and how our soul life has to come under our spirit life if we're ever going to win these conflicts. And uh, you made this very clear yesterday, Colin, that we cannot control our soulish instincts unless we submit them to the word of God. And you were quoting, of course, from Colossians and chapter 3. So um, where does this take us today? It brings us to the realization that you cannot change yourself. It doesn't matter how full of good intentions you are or how many um, uh, how many times you make the effort to change yourself, you will never accomplish anything of any significance in that regard. But then why try to change yourself when God's purposes are change? One of the, one of the biggest charges really that you can bring against Christians is that so many of them resist change when the whole purpose of God is to change us into his likeness, to change us with ever-increasing glory. And of course, you only want to go to heaven if you want to be changed. If you don't want to be changed, then you don't want to go to heaven. Because when we see him as he is, then we shall be transformed into his likeness. So the whole of God's purpose is to change us from what we were into what he wants us to be. But the teaching of Scripture uh, approaches this really from the whole perspective of faith, that God has already done everything through Jesus Christ to make those changes possible, that in Christ we are already a new creation, in Christ we have been made holy, in Christ we have become the righteousness of God. In Christ, we are, are, are already made perfect in God's eyes, in Christ. But of course, in our soul life, we don't see yet that perfection or total holiness and righteousness. We're all aware that in our minds, we can have thoughts that are certainly not of God. In our emotions, we can feel things that definitely do not come from God. And we all know how easy it is to make decisions with our wills that definitely are not the will of God. So we are all in this position where we have to uh, weigh up these two things daily in our lives. And therefore, to stay in that submission uh, to God. Jesus said to the disciples at the Last Supper, Abide in me, remain in me, go on continuously living in me, and I in you. Now, I think that, to me, that is perhaps the key scripture about how to live the Christian life. It is the, the most significant thing that we need to understand. When you become a believer, God takes hold of your life and puts you in Christ. But Jesus says, you have the responsibility to remain in Christ, to live continually in Christ. It's not that God wants to chuck you out. It's that God wants to express his life through your life. And the only way in which you can remain in Christ is by continually submitting that natural life to, um, to the Spirit. So my continual prayer all the way through my life is, Lord, I submit myself to you, spirit, soul, and body. Work in me today, work through me today in the way that you want. And my, my attitude all the time is, Lord, I don't want my soul life to rise up and grieve your spirit in any way whatsoever. I want to stay humble and submitted to you at all times. Now, I found the need to pray constantly like that, just to keep in that right place with God so that he can express his life through me, speak through me, act through me, do whatever he wants to do so that I'm his channel, I'm his vessel, a vessel that he has created for noble use. And that is, of course, the truth for every Christian. You're describing a situation that, that, that is difficult there, Colin, you know, having to really believe God when on the face of things you can't see the outcome. But is there a peace in that journey at the same time? There's never any peace in opposing God. 
I mean, the quickest way to lose your peace is to oppose God or to ignore what he said. Remember what Jesus taught at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where he used this illustration of the wise and the foolish man. The wise man built his house on the rock, and when the storm came, it didn't matter how much it was battered by the wind and the rain, the house stood firm. The foolish man built his house on the sand, so when the storm came, the house collapsed. Now the important thing is how Jesus defines the wise man and the foolish man. And in that illustration, he says that the wise man is the one who heard what God said, the word of God, and did it. The foolish man was the one who heard, but didn't put the word into practice. Interesting, because you see, both heard what God said. Now, there's people listening to me. They've heard the scriptures that I've been reading these last couple of weeks about this subject. You've heard what God has been saying through me about the soul and spirit. Now, there are two kinds of people out there listening to me. There are the wise and the foolish. The wise will put these words into practice. They will submit their soul to the spirit. They will humble themselves before God. They will stay in that place of submitting their natural abilities to the supernatural power and enabling of God. And they will see God working through them. The unfortunate thing is that there are probably some foolish people too who will hear this, but who will not put it into practice. Or put it off to another day. Well, that's the same thing. To delay in responding to God is to say no to him. I'm not prepared to do what you say now. So to delay is to say no. And of course, if people say that, then the likelihood is that they will never get round to obeying him anyway. Um, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands, you will obey what I say. And th this, is, this is the real test of our love, whether we obey God, whether we do seek to live in the way that he wants us to live, or whether we just live to please ourselves. I want to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul says there in verse 2, we always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father the work, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's commending them for living by the Spirit, not in soulishness. And what's the fruit? Their work is produced by faith in God, not in themselves and their abilities. Their labor is prompted by the love that they have been given that has been poured into their hearts by the Holy Spirit, not just by their natural inclinations and emotions. And there are people of perseverance, of endurance, and they needed to be in Thessalonica at that time because there was persecution of the church but their endurance was inspired by their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in believing that he would fulfill all that he had promised to do. That's another good description of what it means to depend upon the spirit rather than the soul. And then Paul continues, For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, with great faith. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. You see, Christianity is taught by example, not just by words. And it's very interesting the way Paul puts this. You became imitators of us and the Lord. He didn't say of the Lord and us. 
Why? Because the first thing a Christian sees or a new believer sees is how the, the other Christians around, especially the leaders, but all Christians, how they live. And they need to see us living in the Spirit, depending upon God, not upon ourselves. So you became imitators of us and of the Spirit. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given you by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, Greece as we know it now. In other words, you followed our example, so you became an example to others. And then Paul says a little later, um, that the, the testimony about them is they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. And he says in, in chapter 2, verse 4, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. So you see, this is true for all of us, isn't it? The testing of our faith proves it's genuine. And the trying, difficult circumstances that we're in sure do test our faith. And this is where we need to prove we trust God, not ourselves. And God enables us in ways that we could never enable ourselves. You've been listening to Faith for Today, presented by Julia Fisher. This program is sponsored by Kingdom Faith. For further information, visit our website, kingdomfaith.com. 